verse 17 and 18. And today's message is entitled, The Last Days. The Last Days. And this message is hopefully going to be a conclusion to the book of Jude, at, while at the same time, it is an introduction to the book of Revelation. And my goal for the book of Revelation is I want to try to, in seven messages, give a flyover to the book of Revelation. Because if I preach verse by verse to that book, we could probably be in that book for two years. I mean, there's so much symbols, and it's all good, but I just want to give you a flyover of the book of Revelation. But I don't think it's any coincidence that when they, they assembled the New Testament books, that they put Jude... Um, they put Jude right in front of the book of Revelation is because they almost go together. And um, so that's why I've entitled this message, The Last Days. And let's look just firstly in verse 17 and 18. Jude says, But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, or in the last days, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. Now, as we realize, as we get closer and closer to the return of Jesus, we all have heard this time and time again, that the days are only going to get more difficult, especially for Christians. Amen? Um, as, as the devil knows his time is beginning to run out, he is going to kind of ramp up his attacks on God's church and God's true people. And as we get closer to the return of Christ, the one institution, the one organization that Satan is going to try to attack harder than anything else is going to be the church. The true church. He is going to attack the church. And when I say a church, I don't mean like a denomination or a building. I mean the people. We are the church. We are the, the bride of Christ. The, the called out ones. The true people of God. The sheep of God. That's us. He's going to attack us. And what is He going to try to do? Well, He's going to try to scoff at us. Use people to ridicule us use people to ostracize, ignore, and make fun of us because His goal is to try to keep us from living the truth and sharing the truth of Jesus with other people because the devil knows if they hear the truth and they come to understand the truth of God's Word, they may get saved. And the devil doesn't want anyone to get saved and to know God. So how can he prevent that from happening? He has to attack the true church of God. And that's what Jude tells us. He says, you must remember. So in other words, it's almost like Jude is saying, it's almost as if Jude is saying, when you start to get persecuted, when you start to have people make fun of you and call you names, when you have people in the mainstream media or people in our culture to begin to say ugly, untrue, unkind things about Christians and the church, we should not be surprised when that happens. We should expect persecution. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Paul tells us that all those who desire to live a godly life for Jesus will suffer persecution. It's not if, it's not maybe, it's just a question of when and how much persecution will we encounter. And if we are living for Jesus... And if we are teaching the truth of Jesus from the Word of God, you will come under attack from the world and you will come under attack from the devil because the devil is using his children, his minions, those people he has deceived, they are held captive by him to do his will and his will is to steal, kill, and destroy. And how is he going to accomplish that? By attacking God's people and God's church and to try to get us to compromise and change the clear teachings of the Word of God. So we shouldn't be surprised as we are in these last days that people will begin to scoff. They will begin to make fun of us. They will begin to try to detract us from our mission. Now one interesting thing about this book of Jude is 
The devil is many times referred to as a serpent or a snake. And one thing about a snake is it blends into its surroundings. That's why a lot of people who go fishing, they step on water moccasins or they step on, you know, copperheads. It's because they camouflage themselves so well that you can't really distinguish a snake from maybe a group of bushes. You accidentally step on it, then you get bit, then the, the venom gets injected into your veins. And that is what Satan does. And what Satan's going to do is he's not going to just attack the church from the outside. Listen to me. He is going to try to deceive people inside the church so that they will be tricked and fooled into doing his will instead of doing God's will. But he's going to make them think that they're doing God's will so they'll keep doing it. Did everybody understand those two or three sentences I just said? That's how Satan works. Satan is not going to come to you and say, Preach against Jesus. Go against Jesus. Go against the Bible. No, no, no. He's, he's much more subtle. He's going to come to you in ways that you least expect, it, in ways that you can't really tell in order to get you to believe. You know, if you, if you read John 16, verse 2, Jesus said in the last days that people are going to kill Christians thinking they're doing the will of God. How shocking. You know, there's a, there's a group of, of Muslims called, you may call them radical Islamic terrorists, but when they flew those planes into the trade towers and killed 3,000 Americans, they believed they were doing the will of God and they were going to heaven when they died. But they were not doing the will of God, they were doing the will of Satan. But Satan had them tricked through their religion, through their false teachings, he had fooled them into thinking they were doing God's will when, when in fact they were doing the devil's will. And that is what Satan is going to do in the last days in the church. Jude verse 3 and 4. That's why Jude says, I felt, I felt like I had to remind y'all of this. That there have been certain people that have crept into the church unnoticed. See, Satan is like a snake and he slithered into the church and he's bit certain people and he's got them so confused and wound up and they believe that they're following the true way of God when in fact they're not and he's deceived them and now they're going about infecting and deceiving others with the deception that has deceived them. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. And so, my friends, I'm saying all this because the way Jude ends his epistle and the way the book of Revelation begins is that's what's going to be happening in these last days. Satan is going to attack the church and he's going to attack the church from within. And his goal is to split and to divide and to scatter God's people. How is he going to split and divide the church? And I'm sure all of us have heard of churches that have split. Churches that have disagreed on certain things and it turned into a bigger mess than what it was supposed to be and it has caused great problems in many churches. I'm here to tell you sometimes a church needs to split. That sounds like a weird statement. Sometimes the church Sometimes the church needs to have a holy divide. If you read Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, Jesus said, I've not come to bring peace on the earth. He said, I've come and I brought a sword. I'm going to divide children from their parents and parents from their children and this one from that one and that one from this one. The point being is sometimes there has to be a division in the church. Um, that's one reason why I left the United Methodist Church. I resigned from that denomination. I split from that church. Why? Because they were advocating practices and beliefs that were clearly contrary to the Word of God. And I could not stand with it any longer, so I resigned from the church. Okay? So sometimes there is a need to say, look, that church is not preaching the Bible. That church is not loving one another. That church is not following Jesus. And they're not going to change, so I need to leave. I'll give you one person from history that did that. He was a German. His name was Martin Luther. He protested the Roman Catholic Pope and the priest and the cardinals and the bishops because he said, y'all are not teaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And he tried to reform the church. 
He didn't try to split it, divide it. He tried to reform it. But when he realized they were not going to change, he split off and he started what we call the Protestant church. That's what you and I are. We are Protestants. Why? Because we protest the Roman Catholic false teachings that they have advocated for many, many years. We protest it. We are Protestants. So sometimes there is a right to divide and split a church if that church is clearly contradicting the Word of God. However, many times in the church, people want to split a church over non-essential secondary issues like the color of the carpet or like what style of music do you play or how should people dress. Other things like that that should not divide us but many times do. But the goal of the devil is to try to split and divide the church in an unrighteous way. Now look in verse 16, and I'm going to real quickly run through these verses. I'm going to show you how the devil tries to unrighteously divide and split the people of God. Verse 16. <clears throat> these are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. This is, uh, this is the way Satan tries to unrighteously divide and split the church. He, he tries to get certain people to begin to grumble and complain. That's where it always starts. If you go back to the children of Israel, whether you're in Numbers chapter 16, you're in uh, Exodus chapter 16, Exodus 14, where did the children of Israel go wrong? They began what? Murmuring and complaining. Moses, why are we doing this? Moses, why can't we do that? Moses, why did you take us out of Egypt? We got to eat free, free meat in Egypt. Why are we out here in this wilderness? You remember reading that. They murmured. They complained. They began to find fault with every little thing that was done. <clears throat> and that is the way churches begin to split when people begin to, to, mum to mumble, murmur, complain, find fault with everything that the church or the board of elders or the pastor says are done. It's never good enough. They murmur, they complain, and they bellyache. Now, if your pastor is not preaching Jesus, you need to murmur and complain, and you need to go to him and complain to him directly. I did that to one of my pastors when I was at the Methodist church. I went to his office, and I said, can we talk about this because I have a real issue with what you're preaching? He said, well, what's your problem? I said, you don't preach Jesus. You don't preach about Jesus. I don't know what you preach about. You preach about money or this and that, but you don't tell people about Jesus. And isn't that the purpose of being a Christian church is we worship Jesus Christ? Then why don't we ever hear about Him when you preach? Well, I guess I probably shouldn't have said that because that man got real mad at me. Okay? And I was like 19 years old. He got really upset at me. And maybe I didn't say it in the kindest way, but... You know, that's a time when you need... If, listen, if the Bible puts it like this. If you have a complaint, say I'm mad at Miss Bonner about something. If I have a complaint with her, I can either murmur and complain and get bitter about it, or I can go to her and say, look, I love you, can we talk? And I go to her in humility, and we reconcile and work out our differences. Amen? And if a church would love one another like Jesus loves us, there would be no unrighteous division or splits or factions in the church because we're all one family. And just like any family, we're not going to agree on everything. Me and Dion don't agree on everything, and she's my wife. We have arguments. We have disagreements. But we've made a commitment. We are one. We're going to follow Christ. And no matter what, we're not giving up on one another because we love one another. That's what it means to be buried. And that's how I feel about each and every one of y'all. Y'all are my brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no division based on race or sex or income or any of that. We are one family and we're ride or die and we're going to stick together and we're going to help each other glorify Jesus and nothing should divide us. Nothing. If you're letting something divide us, that's your issue. It's not mine. If you have a complaint, you have the obligation to go tell the person if you think they've sinned against you, go to them in private and be reconciled to your brother. Don't murmur, grumble, and complain. I'm talking to myself too because sometimes I do that at my job. In the past, I've murmured and complained. Why are we doing this at our school? This is the craziest idea. And the Holy Spirit convicts me and says, Sam, 
You're not going to accomplish nothing by doing that. Go to your leadership and lovingly talk to them. And that's what we need to do, especially as God's people. But these ones that the devil has deceived, they grumble, they complain. Why do they murmur? <clears throat> Why do they murmur and complain? Because they follow their own sinful desires. They follow their own lust, their own passions. That's the whole point. See, anytime you see me complaining about the church, I'm saying we're not doing what the Bible says. We got to do what the Bible says. So I start fussing about it. People that are not truly Christians that are deceived by Satan and, and, and have been sent into the church to cause division, what they murmur and complain about is their needs are not being met and things are not being, not being done the way they want it to be done, so they start fussing about it. That is a sinful complaint. Amen? Is everybody with me today? I'm not, say, I'm not saying I'm perfect now. Don't, 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 I'm not perfect in this area. But I'm here to tell you, you are never going to hear me complain about anything that's done in this church. The only complaint I would ever have is, guys, I think we need to be a little more truer to what the Bible clearly says us to do. That's all I'm going to fuss about. I don't care about the style of music as long as it glorifies Jesus. I don't care how you dress as long as you don't look like uh, it's Im Im immodest. Is that a correct word? Immodest. I'm not going to focus on any of that. But many people oftentimes do, and they split a church over sinful, stupid reasons. Now, in order to split and divide a church, it always begins with murmuring and complaining because their way isn't being done. Now, let me say one quick thing, and I say this with all due respect to the Board of Elders here, but that other day we wanted to meet outside. I did not want to meet outside. I was dead set against it, but it's a two-thirds vote. And the way they vote, I respect. And you have never heard me complain about anything that's been voted on in this church until now. But I'm not complaining about it. I'm just saying that whatever those men decide, I'm going to support it unless those men are asking me to do something against this Bible. Then I would say I respectfully disagree. Okay? So we as a church have to stay unified. We have to stay together. And we have to make sure that if we have a complaint, address it the biblical way. And forgive one another because we're a family. Families have problems. Families have weird people like me. And you just sometimes just have to pray for me. Amen. And give grace to one another. And that's what this country needs right now. We're at such a turning point in this country. And everybody's pointing fingers and shouting and screaming and ready to hurt one another. We as the church have a great opportunity to show that we have blacks and whites in this church right now. We have people from different political parties and we all love and respect one another, not because we're good, but because we have a great God and Savior who is Jesus Christ and He has united us one in Christ. Now in order to split a church, grumbling and complaining begins, but then look, he says they are loudmouth boasters. So in order to split a church, the complaining then has to evolve into I have to get people to join me in my complaining. We all work with people like this, don't we, Dion? Somebody at work starts complaining, and then they say, What do you think about it, Sam? Do you really think we should have to stay till 4 o'clock for bus duty? That is so stupid. What do they want me to do? They want me to come along with them and start belly aching with them. And in the past, sometimes I have. Yeah, I know this is stupid. You know what I'm saying? You know, like, Lord forgive me, I shouldn't have said that. But you know, that's what happens. And these people begin to try to recruit followers to, to, to follow their ideas and their ways. And so in order to convince you to follow them, they have to be loudmouth boasters. That means they're pompous. They're bombastic. That means that when you talk to them, they're not talking about Jesus. They're talking about how great they are. I, I'm going to give you an example. I knew a guy when I played baseball. And... He used to make fun of people. He used to pick on people. He did a skit in front of the whole school making fun of another child who accidentally had a number two accident on himself, and he was part of a skit that made fun of that boy. Now, I talked to him at baseball while he was telling dirty jokes to everybody, cutting up, having a good old time with his friends, and I would ask him, I would say, and I could say his name right now, and he's a pastor at a kind of big church in Dothan area right now, and I pray that he's changed. But this person said to me, Sam, oh, you just want to understand how close I am to God. 
The other night I was praying and my bed started shaking and I saw an angel stand beside my bed and he reaffirmed God's commission and God's anointing on my life. Oh, you just don't know all the things that I've seen and all the powers that I have that God has gifted me. Oh, Sam, you won't never understand. Hallelujah. I mean, it was a great story, but it was all about him. He was bragging about how great and awesome he was. Instead of what Christians should be bragging and boasting about is how great and awesome Jesus is that He would save a wretched, worthless sinner like me. But I'm telling y'all, these people, in order to deceive you, and I'm not trying to be mean to Benny Hinn and Joel Osteen and all these other ones, but you listen to them preach. Jesse Duplantis is the main one. Oh, I went to heaven. God took me to heaven. God showed me this. God showed me that. Oh, I saw the face of Jesus and He talked to me. And He said, Jesse, what should I do? God's never going to ask you what should He do. God's already got the plan. God already knows what's going on. We're not going to counsel God. He has all knowledge. Okay? <laughs> so many outlandish things that, that Jesse Duplantis says... And people just believe it. Why? Because it sounds so convincing. He's such a good speaker. And he wants people to believe in him because he wants you to follow him and give him your money. That's what he's after so he can buy that new $25 million jet. <laughs> I'm so sorry, y'all. I don't mean to upset anybody. And if I'm upset, if y'all like Jesse Duplantis, I love you. Just quit watching it. <laughs> He's a funny guy. He'd be a good comedian, but not a good preacher. So then they show favoritism to gain advantage. Now this is Joel Osteen right here. This, the, this verse was written for him. They show favoritism to gain advantage. That means that when the devil wants to cause division in the church, he starts with complaining. Then he moves from complaining to you got to get people to follow you. So how do you get people to follow you? Well, you brag how awesome you are, and then you do this to them. You speak nice, flattering, kind blessings upon them. It's, it's kind of like I had somebody, I don't know if I should say this, but I had somebody do this to me in one of the churches I pastored. They said this to me. They would, they would put on Facebook every week, Oh, how anointed Sam Davis is, and he's so full of the Holy Ghost, and oh, he's just so powerful. If you've never heard him preach, you ought to come here. He is just the, he's the greatest of all time was basically what this person told me. And then I would talk to them on the phone, and here's what this person would tell me. How much money are you making at that church? Oh, I'm making $125 a week. Oh, you know, if I was the, if I was the treasurer, if I, if I, if I was on the, on the board of directors at that church, you'd be making $300 easy. We've got to know. They ought to put you first and trust that God to meet the needs of that church. They should be paying you way more than what they're paying you. And if you just put me in charge, I would see to it that it would get done because you deserve it. What was this person doing to me? Flattering me to gain advantage. Duh. What does Joel Osteen do when he preaches to you every week and he tells you how special and awesome you are and how God just needs you and without you, God is incomplete. He is flattering you, speaking nice-sounding blessings upon you in order to fool you. That's the way the devil works. And you have to realize that the devil has... Now, do I believe that person is a devil worshiper? No. But do I believe that they are deceived by the devil? Yes, I do. And we have to be very, very careful because Satan will send those people into the church in order to complain, cause division, recruit disciples after themselves, and then they will flatter you and try to get you to come along and join them. And what we have to do in love is say, no, I'm going to follow Christ and His Word, and if you're not standing for Christ and His Word, then I cannot and I will not follow you. Okay, i got to hurry up here. So now let's go to verse 19. Verse 19. So my first point there in verse 17 and 18 is that the devil is going to try to divide the church. My second point was in verse 16. This is how he divides the church. And then my third point is verses 19 through 23 real quick. And this is what we should, this should be our response. This should be our response to those that the devil sends in in the last days to divide the church. Now let me say something real quick. <clears throat> the devil... The devil, 
the, the people that follow the devil will be able to do signs and wonders in the last days. Let's just get that straight right now. In the last days, I mean, if you go back to Exodus 7, verse 11, Exodus chapter 8, you remember Moses, the guy named Moses. And he had a staff, and he could throw it down and make it a snake. Well, Pharaoh's magicians could throw down their stick, and it turned into a snake too. Now, Moses' snake ate the other one, but he could still do it. Now, did you read further along in there that Moses and Aaron were able to turn all the water in Egypt blood red? Well, so were Pharaoh's people. They could do it too. Moses and Aaron had frogs come up from the Nile. But Pharaoh's magicians, they could do the same thing too. If you read the book of Revelation, it says, and uh, I mean, if you read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, it says that Satan working through the Antichrist, working through his people, can do signs and wonders. So why am I saying all this to you? Because what Jude is about to say to us is something you need to remember. Because just because someone can do a healing, a miracle, a sign, or wonder, doesn't mean that person is speaking from God. It could be a counterfeit. If you don't believe me, go down to New Orleans on Bourbon Street and you go in there and see some of those palm readers, crystal balls, tarot cards. They'll tell you some things. That, and I haven't been in there, but my... And Mama, please forgive me. But back in her day, she did the tarot cards. And I've known people that have done Ouija boards. That stuff's real. Now, there's a spirit. There is a spirit or spirits that are working through those things. Don't mistake it. That's not just you pushing the finger. That thing's moving. But it's not the Holy Spirit. So if you open yourself up to that spiritual realm and you start saying, Oh Lord, speak to me through a dream. Speak to me through a vision. Give me a new, sun, give me a new sign. Give me the... I'm telling you, you've got to be careful because when you get away from the light of this book, you get into the darkness. And once you get into the darkness, the devil can do a lot of sleight of hand, magic, black magic stuff that will pull you away from Christ. Are you with me? So that's why we need to listen to this in verse 19 through 23 real quick. Now, verse 19, it says, It is these people who cause division. They're worldly people. They're devoid of the Spirit. In other words... He's telling us again that we as Christians, as we walk with the Lord, there's going to be people in the church that cause division, unrighteous division. Why do they do it? They're worldly people. They're focused on their wants and their desires. Don't be fooled by them. They do not have the Holy Spirit. If they had the Holy Spirit, they'd be more focused on Jesus and His Word. Y'all got that. Look in verse 20. This is what we need to do. But you, beloved. Look at that word, beloved. That means God loves you. If you're a Christian, He loves you in a deep way, in a special, eternal way. Tracy, you love this doctrine. God, God chose you and set His love on you before you were born, before the worlds were made. You are His specially loved. You are the apple of His eye. Not because you are good. Not because there's something good in you. But you are now made good. You are now made worthy. You are now made beautiful because God has chose to make you His beloved. Isn't that good? Thank you, Fred. That's good. Joe Wolstein don't tell you that, but I will because I love you. Now verse 20. But you, beloved, build yourself up on your most holy faith. So this is what we have to do in the last days. Don't be deceived by Chris Angel or anybody else that can do signs and wonders. You be built up and made strong by feeding on the Word of God. Okay? Don't base... I know, so, I, I, know I had a person in this church... Oh, I'm going to get so much trouble. I'm not, I shouldn't even be saying this, y'all. Lord, forgive me. I'm a, I don't want nobody to firebomb my house. But I've had people in the past tell me, I know God spoke to me. I said, okay, that's cool. And I know He spoke to me because so-and-so, and I'm not going to tell the guy's name that was up here preaching that Sunday, he testified that what was in my spirit was in his spirit. So I know it's from the Lord. Hallelujah. Has that person... Has that person not read 1 Kings 22? Remember when there were 400 prophets that all prophesied to the king of Israel, yeah, go into battle. The Lord's going to give you the victory. And there was one prophet that said, no, nope, if you go into battle, you're going to die. And the king said, oh man, this one guy always prophesies negative things about me. He can't say one nice thing about me. 
Well, what did the king try to do? He went into battle and he tried to dress as a normal soldier, thinking that that would protect him. Well, one of the guys shot an arrow and it randomly pierced right through the edge of his armor, through his heart, through his chest, and it killed him on the battlefield. Just as that one prophet said it would. If he went to battle, he would die. So the point is, just because you are in a church where everybody in the church is saying, we have heard from God, that is true, that doesn't always mean that you or that group has heard from God. How do you know if we've heard from God? Does it come out of this book? Do what you believe come out of this book? Do the visions and the dreams and the prophetic words that you're wanting to say, does it line up and does it, does it come from Jesus and His Word? If not, I'm not saying you didn't have a spiritual experience. I'm just saying it wasn't the Holy Spirit. That's all I'm saying to you. I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm saying that to warn you because the devil is a master deceiver. Amen? So build yourself up on your most holy faith. What does he say the next thing? Pray in the Holy Spirit. Does that mean pray in tongues? I've had people ask me that. If you like to go home and pray in tongues, I respect that. That's your belief. I do not see Jesus ever praying in tongues. And I do not see any of the apostles ever telling you to go home and pray in tongues. If you want to do that, I respect that. But I believe praying in the Holy Spirit means praying in line with the Spirit, which means praying in line with the Word of God. So what should we be praying in the last days? Lord, I pray that people get saved. Lord, I pray that people grow closer to You. Lord, I pray that my children get born again and that they love You. Lord, I pray for our church that there wouldn't be division. Lord, I pray that we would worship You in spirit and in truth. That's what we should be praying for, not for new BMWs, not for a million dollars to be magically added to our bank account, not for these worldly things, but we should be praying Your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. That's, that's praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're not praying in the Holy Spirit, you're praying, Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's not praying in the Spirit. And also, if you're going home praying in tongues and you have no clue what you're praying for, how is that praying? Praying is praying with your heart, but also with your mind. And that's what Paul said. I would rather pray and speak with my spirit and with my understanding. Amen. It's just something to think about. But if you practice praying in tongues, I love you and I promise I totally respect that. Verse 21, keep yourself in the love of God. In these last days, what does keep yourself in the love of God mean? It means John 15, 9 through 11. It means obey God's commandments. Jesus said, abide in my love. How do we abide in His love? Keeping His words and His commandments. Amen. As everybody with me, I know this may not be the most exciting sermon, but I'm telling you, once we get raptured and somebody gets hold of this video, I'm sure they'll watch this video and say, that old redneck there from Abbeville, he's telling us something we need because this isn't just something we need to hear now, but it's something for those people that will be left behind during the Great Tribulation. They can go back and watch this and say, this Antichrist, he's doing all kinds of miracles and everybody says he's from God, but this book says, watch out for him. So keep yourself in the love of God. Be obedient to God's Word. Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. What should we be doing in these last days? Looking for Jesus to come back. Aren't you excited? Aren't you glad if Jesus come back today? Wouldn't you be excited if you saw Jesus come and you heard that trumpet sound and all of a sudden you're called up off the ground and you meet Him in the air? Wouldn't that be a great day? If it's not a great day, I would question your salvation. Because on that day, all the wrongs will be, made, will be made right and we will be with Jesus in paradise. So we should be looking for Jesus to come. Verse 22 and 23. Oh man, I'm right. I went way too long here. This is what we should do to those people that are confused by these false teachings. We should have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garments that have been stained by the flesh. In other words, there are going to be people, maybe even in your church, that believe some wacky stuff. What should you do? Have mercy on them. Say, look man, I love you. We may disagree. That's fine. And if you didn't listen to our podcast, me and my buddy Brian started some crazy podcast. The last episode... 
please listen to it because he gets on there and he's a Southern Baptist minister. And he says, when I first met Sam, he challenged me on some of my beliefs. And he had scripture after scripture and I didn't like it and I didn't agree with it. But when I went back to the book and I double checked it, I found out what he was saying was the truth of God. And it changed his life. Folks, that's what we have to do with people in the church that may have some, some wrong beliefs. Say, go back to the Word of God. Have mercy on them. Try to help them. Other people, you've got to be more aggressive with them. You've got to snatch them from the fire and say, look, man, you're believing a heresy. If you believe that, you're going to hell. You've got to wake up. And then other people, you need to try to help them, but you better be careful that they don't suck you in, that they don't stain your garments. You go and you help them and you love them and you warn them, but you be very, very careful. And then verse 24 and 25 is the promise. This is what we're going to end on. This is the promise for us in these last days. No matter how dark these days get, no matter how bad they get for us in the church, no matter what trick Satan tries to send into the church to deceive us, we are told now to Him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. This is the promise that God says to us as His people. He says, no matter what Satan tries to do, if you are truly God's child, you will never be fooled. You know why? 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 says, you have the anointing. You have the anointing. What is the anointing? You have the Holy Spirit and you know all things. You know the truth. So therefore, when an imposter tries to deceive you and says, hey, what he's preaching ain't right, come follow me and we'll get closer to God. Come follow me and then you'll see miracles. Come follow me and you'll experience the Holy Ghost like you never have before. If you're truly God's child, then God's going to keep you and He's going to protect you and He's going to remind you deep in your heart that that's wrong. And you will not be fooled. It doesn't matter if he can make a, fly, a rabbit pop out of his hand. You would say, nope, I'm not following you. I'm following Christ and His Word. And if you can't show me this clearly from the Bible, I am not going to believe or support such a movement. Amen? So no matter what happens, God is going to keep you from stumbling. He is going to bring you all the way to glory. He's not going to lose any of His people. I have people say, can you lose your salvation? Let me put it to you this way. Does Jesus lose any of His sheep? It says, my sheep know me, my sheep hear my voice, my sheep follow me. I give them eternal life, John 10, 27, and 28, and they will never what? They'll never perish. So if you say that people lose salvation, you say Jesus loses his sheep and they die and go to hell. I say no. God is going to take care of you, sustain you. He's going to guide you all the way home to glory, and you will never be fooled by false teachers. You will never commit apostasy. You'll never fall away from the truth of God. Why? Because you have God living inside of you the Holy Spirit, and He will always lead you in the truth, which is Jesus. He has all glory, majesty, and dominion. Nothing's greater than Him. And if He's for us, who can be against us? Amen. Not even the gates of hell will be able to stop us. Amen. So as we enter these last days, and I know next Sunday we have our, we're going to honor Miss Camille and, and uh, I think we're going to do something for Deja as well. Um, but we're also we're going to honor them for our graduates. And then the following Sunday, we're going, to, we're going to begin with Revelation chapter 1. So I encourage you to read Revelation chapter 1 because it will scare the daylights out of you. <laughs> In a good way. So we'll begin Revelation that Sunday. and We'll have Elder Frank. We will be broadcasting live next week. So we have Elder Frank. We'll be delivering the message next week. But as I pray today, I hope all my ramblings, I've had no notes, I'm just speaking from my heart. I don't think it was the best sermon I ever did. But I want you to know that in these last days, there's going to be attacks on the church. And one way that the devil's going to attack the church is by sending people in the church, deceiving them, and they're going to try to go about deceiving others. And they're going to begin by murmuring, finding fault with the true church and oh we shouldn't just preach the Bible, we should do this. They find fault, they complain, they brag how spiritual they are, they flatter you to get you to follow them, they'll cause division and chaos in the church and we should not be fooled by them. We need to build ourselves up on the Word of God, pray in the Word of God, pray in the Holy Spirit, 
Keep ourselves in the love of God. Look for the return of Jesus. Have mercy on other people and try to lead them to the truth. And the whole time know that God's going to protect us and His true church. And we're going to come out winners in the end. That's how Jude ends. That's how Revelation begins. Because if you don't believe that, when the rapture comes, you're not going to come. If you don't subscribe, this message that I just preached, if that's not you, if you're not doing those things, if you're not striving to do those things, you will be tricked. And you will miss the rapture. And I'm going to tell you, if you've read Revelation 6 through 19, we're going to get into that. Man, that's a time I would not wish on my worst enemy. It's going to be hell on earth. And so we're going to get into that as we go through Revelation. So I just appreciate y'all coming out today. I appreciate everybody watching. And um, let's pray together.